Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, a podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Meslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Daryl Bossart is a salt expert, having worked in and studied salt and minerals his whole life. He's passionate about healthy living, healthy eating, and lifelong learning. Daryl grew up working for the family business in Redmond, Utah, and then earned a Bachelor's of Science degree at Southern Utah University, followed by an MBA at Western Governors University. Welcome to the show, Daryl. Scott, thanks so much for having me on today. This is going to be exciting. Of course. I love salt. I love talking about it. I love learning about it. Um, I love talking to people about it. And so today is really a treat for me. Um, and where I'd love to start is, you know, salt is so demonized in our society and people always ask me, how can salt possibly be good for you? So let's start with why people think salt is bad for you and why people think they should eliminate sodium from their diet. That's a great question, Scott. And if you go back, um, for the last hundred years or so, even, um, you ask people to raise their hand and, and see who has heard salt's bad. A lot of people are going to raise their hand. Um, but yet if we went back a much further than that, and let's say we were, you know, before the invention of the refrigerator, all of us would have been eating more salt because all of the meat that we ate outside of season would have been preserved in salt. If we added any, uh, fermented veggies, sauerkraut, kimchi, things like that, they would have been preserved in salt. And yet today we hear that salt's bad for us. But what's even more interesting, if we go back even further, every civilization started around access to the salt deposit. And the trade routes were based around the salt deposit. And it was so important that it was written about in most religious texts of the, you know, throughout time. And Roman soldiers were even paid sometimes insult. And so the term salary is salt-based. And this idea that you may have heard of this saying is a man worth his salt comes from being paid in salt. And if you weren't worth enough or you weren't earning your keep, then you weren't worth your salt. And when you go to the hospital today, every hospital in the world, when you walk in, they're going to give you an IV. And that IV is saline solution, which is salt water. And so salt in order of importance, it goes oxygen and then water and then salt. And without salt, the body will start to shut down. And so we absolutely need salt. But yet, as you pointed out, most people have heard salt bad. Yeah. Yeah. That's really helpful. I, I love that overview. And um, I, I try to emphasize the importance of salt with people all the time. It's one of my top tips for people starting a carnivore a ketogenic lifestyle and and how does the importance of salt change when we're on these types of low carb diets or a carnivore diet great question so salt is always really important but as you switch over and start eating more proteins water is actually it, the body requires more water to process protein than it does than it does plant based or or other foods and so let's say if if you and I were on a deserted island and we had limited water, then we've got to be really careful about over-consuming protein in that situation. Because if we can't replace the water that our bodies are going to use, our bodies are going to burn through a lot more of the water that we have with us when we're eating a higher protein diet. And so we just need to be aware of that. And as we eat more protein, we've also got to have more water for the body to digest it. And so We've established that salt is essential for life, but yet you ask that question, how did all of us end up with this idea that salt, this white poison that's going to kill all of us, when we know that salt has always been essential for health, animals have to have salt to live, we have to have salt to live, but yet how did it become this, this negative or this, this problematic thing? Well, there was a study years ago, and 
this study was based on feeding rats copious amounts of sodium. And what they found was when they just force fed this massive sodium dose, that the rats actually started to have some problems. Well, a couple of problems with that is they were just using amounts that were just astronomical. And so this one study painted salt as the bad as a bad thing in our diet um, because of this one study. And yet, if you look at the, the process of salt, salt is absolutely essential. And so when people started going on low salt diets, they actually noticed some, some downside to that. And in your episode show notes, I can send you some links to some articles from the American Journal of Medicine, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, that show that actually a, a diet in less than 2,300 milligrams causes more cardiovascular disease mortality. And so now doctors and health professionals and, and dietitians are realizing that salt has a, a big place. Um, and most importantly, is, as you know, somebody comes and works with you or another health coach or a, a, a nutritionist, and they start changing their diet and eating a more natural diet, they're, they're, rather than eating in cans and processed foods and potato chips and French fries and, and all of this really nutrient poor food that has processed salt on it, then people start realizing they've got to go out of their way to add salt to their diet. Now, if you're eating a very processed diet, eating out of cans, eating out of boxes, salt is a great preservative. And so because of that, a lot of these processed foods have processed salt on it. And that's another factor. And we can talk about that in a minute is the difference in the way salt has always been created and harvested by our early ancestors and how some of the salt hits our kitchen tables today. And that's a two very different products. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually leads right into what my next question was going to be is how is salt generally produced and, and why has the quality of salt changed over time? Yeah, it's a great question. Very insightful. So if you look at the way salt has always been harvested by our ancestors, it came from one of three places. It came from a current ocean and the, the seawater occurs at about two to 3% sodium and chloride our bodies are 0.9%. And so the reason, if you've ever been swimming in the ocean and you accidentally get some salt water in your eye or you get it in your nose, it burns because it's two to three times more salty than our, than our bodies are. So our ancestors, what they would do, they'd take the seawater and they would pull it out of the ocean, put it in a bucket or put it in a clay-lined pond. And then the water starts to evaporate because of the sun. And so it evaporates, becomes 3%, 4%, 5%. At 26% sodium and chloride, that's max salinity. So water can only hold in solution 26% salt. And then as it gets more salty, the salt crystals will start to, start to fall out of suspension because it's just too salty and, and settle out on the bottom of your bucket or on the bottom of your clay-lined pond. Now, seawater occurs as a complex chloride. So our bodies are primarily sodium and chloride, but we also have magnesium chloride, potassium chloride, calcium chloride, these, these other complex chlorides. And if you look at seawater, seawater occurs as a complex chloride, mostly sodium and chloride, but it does have some other trace elements in there. So when you bring the seawater in and you let it all settle off together, you not only get the sodium and chloride, but you also get trace amounts. And, and I say trace because they're relatively small, not a dietary source of magnesium or potassium or calcium or iodine or anything, but sodium. But you have these other complex chlorides and minerals that will settle off in the seawater. So that's, that was the one way you could get salt. The second way was from a dead sea. Now, there are dead seas. There's the dead sea in Israel. There's the dead sea here in Utah called the Great Salt Lake. And these dead seas were uh, historic seabeds that were trapped and cut off and have been settled off. Now, one of the challenges with the Dead Sea is that it's primarily magnesium and potassium chloride, not sodium and chloride. So if you ever ate salt from the Dead Sea, it tastes very bitter and it's not what our bodies are based on. Our bodies are based on sodium and chloride, which is why that's the IV you get in the hospital. But Dead Seas are one option to get uh, salt that our bodies need. And then the third one is from an ancient seabed. And animals have found these all over the world. And so you, humans would watch the animals and they would go and start eating the soil, what looked like the soil. And what they would realize, that was an ancient seabed, a seabed that was laid down eons ago back in the Pangaea supercontinent when much, uh, much of the earth was down at sea level. And now it's been pushed up into these crystal forms. 
And so there are these ancient seabeds that you can get salt from. Now, I mentioned that the nature of salt changed, and it did that around the turn of the century. And so salt companies started to realize that in seawater, we have sodium chloride. We also have some potassium chloride, some calcium chloride. And the way salt had always been harvested is in that one big, nice pond. However, salt companies realized that they could use a different membrane or a different layer in that pond. They could bring the seawater in and they could pull off the calcium chloride, the magnesium chloride, move it to the next pond, pull out the potassium chloride, and then do a series of evaporation ponds. They could start to manipulate some of those other chlorides, and then they would sell those off to different industries. It didn't sound like a big deal at the time, and those other chlorides are at a small level. But what we know now is the body really does well and needs these trace elements and trace minerals that are that are in our soils and that are in our food and that are in our salt. So that was one challenge when the nature of salt started to change in terms of, of that processing. Now, the second challenge, and I think this is a bigger deal, is salt in the body. One of the main functions is to help balance the fluids. And so the salt crystal sodium works with potassium and they, there's a sodium potassium pump that helps balance the intercellular and extracellular fluids, the fluid that's inside the cell and the fluid that's outside the cell. And that balance is really important and that's salt's job, one of salt's many jobs. But salt, because of that, is naturally hygroscopic. That means it, it draws moisture to it. So if you have a big salt crystal on your kitchen table in a humid uh, area or on a humid day, that salt crystal actually acts as a dehumidifier and it will suck moisture out of the air and there'll be a pool of water actually under that salt crystal. Because of this, and a lot of meat houses, meat lockers, they'll put some big salt crystals in there to help draw out that moisture in the air because salt is, is hygroscopic. The problem with that is if you have salt crystals in your shaker on a humid day or it's raining outside, your salt crystals will start to clump together and they get kind of sticky and wet. And one of the ways to stop that is to just pick up your salt shaker and tap it in your palm a couple of times and it will break up those salt crystals. But industry looked at that and said, hey, what kind of chemicals could we coat that salt crystal with to stop it from absorbing moisture so it doesn't get sticky in the shaker? And so people thought, hey, this would be great, a nice convenience. We don't have to put rice in our shaker to help you know, displace the moisture. We don't have to tap it on our wrist or tap it on our hand to kind of break up the, the little bit of a salt clumpy in the shaker. The problem with that, as you can kind of see where I'm going, is salt's job in the body is to draw and interact with moisture. And so if you take this natural product whose job is to interact with moisture, and now you coat that crystal with a chemical that stops it from interacting with moisture. And these chemicals are things like yellow preciated soda, which is sodium ferrocyanide. There's another one that's called sodium silicoaluminate, um, kind of similar to like what an antiperspirant is supposed to do as far as you know, draw and block moisture. So if you take a salt crystal and you coat it in this chemical, no wonder salt starts to have a problem where natural salt doesn't have that same impact. A lot of people ask me about how to make liver more tasteful and how to cook it or incorporate other organ meats on carnivore. Optimal Carnivore can help you do just that with their grass-fed organ complex. It was created by carnivores for carnivores. They start by sourcing 100% grass-fed organ meats from New Zealand, gently freeze-drying the organs, and encapsulating them into convenient bovine gelatin capsules. Just six of these capsules a day is the same as eating an ounce of raw organ meat. I personally take these every single day, as does my wife. Even though we both eat liver and other organ meats, our ancestors would have eaten the whole animal. And this unique blend has nine different organs, including beef liver, brain, thymus, kidney, spleen, etc. And I think it's great to get a daily dose of these organs when you can. So it covers all your bases, whether you're at home or traveling. What's also cool is they plant a tree for every product sold, which helps the environment. So visit www.optimalcarnwar.com slash carnwarecast and use the code carnwar 10 to receive 10% off your purchase. Thanks and back to the show. That's a great overview for folks who are like, I don't understand the difference between salts. What is what is, what is so bad about regular table salts or regular sea salt? Um, 
and Daryl, what, what are some of the signs, or I, I guess, um, expanding on that last question, can you talk a little bit about Redmond real salt and how it's different and how it's produced? Yeah. So there's a lot of great salts in the world and there's three questions that I think everybody should ask. And we can talk about those uh, towards the end here. Um, and I think if you ask those questions, you will find a good quality salt product. And one of those is, you know, getting better at looking at labels. And I think a lot of people are becoming more aware of that. So the company that I'm with is Redmond, um, and we're a mineral company in Utah. And the brand of our salt is called Real Salt. And in the 1950s, my grandfather and his brother had a farm in central Utah. And there was a pretty good drought that year. And the farm wasn't doing all that well. But just north and south of their farm, there was an outcropping of salt that had been pushed up and discovered by the early inhabitants of the area long before the, you know, the pioneers and the Western settlers came into the valley and then, you know, settled this little town called Redmond because there's three red mounds behind this town. And underneath the town is there's a salt dome that's been pushed up from the Jurassic era. And so my grandfather and his brother knew there was salt north and south of their farm. And so in the 1950s, they figured, hey, there's, there's salt north and south of us. Uh, there's probably salt underneath us. And so they took out a loan and plowed the corn and the alfalfa out of the way. And about 30 feet below the surface hit this ancient seabed salt deposit. And geologists say this salt was laid down during the Jurassic era, which is 150 to 250 million years ago. Of course, I wasn't alive back then to confirm the actual dates. Um, but it was laid down a long time ago, back when Utah was at sea level. And they figure the Arctic Ocean flooded several times down through Utah, covering all of Utah, parts of Colorado, parts of Idaho. Um, a big chunk of the West was covered by this ancient inland seabed called the Sundance Sea. So if any of your listeners Google search the Sundance Sea, they will see this ancient seabed that covered all of Utah during the Jurassic era. Now, under heat and pressure, um, you know, volcanic activity, the seabed gets buried. Um, it's deep within the earth. It's compressed. Now it's just this mineral salt from, from the Jurassic era. And then as Utah is pushed up as part of the Great Basin, this salt crisp, the salt dome, this ancient uh, seabed was pushed up as well. And primarily, you know, back in the 1950s, my grandfather and his brother started selling the salt to farmers and to the state of Utah to keep the roads clear. You know, salt's a great melter for roads. And they used it for themselves and the family. And they noticed it tasted really good at a mild kind of sweet salt flavor, but weren't really selling it for food salt at the time. And then when the health food movement in the U.S. started to gain momentum in the 1970s, a nutritionist came through and got a tour of the salt deposit and went home and wrote this article saying that, in his opinion, the most mineral-rich, tastiest salt that he'd ever found was from this ancient seabed in Utah. And so he started getting health food stores calling and saying, hey, we'd love to, to add this healthy salt that we're hearing about to our health food stores. And at the time, we weren't selling it you know, that way. And family sat around and said, what do we call this? It needs a brand. It's, it's Redmond salt, but it's, it's not you know, processed salt. It's not um, specialty salt. It's, it's just real salt. And so the name stuck, and that's how we have real salt today. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I absolutely love the brand. I love all of your products and I've used them for a while. Um, can we talk about uh, what are the signs and symptoms of too little salt? And also on the flip side, can we get too much salt? And what are some of the signs of that? Yeah. And that's, this is one that we get asked a lot. And with salt, like water and like many other things, it does come down to the person, the person's lifestyle, their diet. And so there is some some variation there. And so what I like to talk to people about is, is learning to listen to their body and learning to see, you know, learn to know the symptoms of being thirsty. And a lot of people are going around way dehydrated. Um, and I think learning to listen to our bodies again, you know, humans have, have changed a lot over the, the last many years, but really in terms of diet, and you probably know this more than many, diets really started to change. And, you know, humans never had this huge access to sugary refined carbs at a moment's notice. Um, you know, our, our stomachs and our bodies aren't designed to be grazers like our friends, the cows. 
Um, but yet sometimes we tend to think that way. And if you look at the last hundred years with this instant access to sugary drinks and, and uh, nutrient poor foods, that's really changed. And so getting back to our bodies and listening to our bodies talk, then I think we can make some, some better choices. So one of the first signs though of, of dehydration and low salt is actually irritability. So if you're, if your girlfriend, boyfriend, spouse, you know, um, kids are starting to get a little ornery or, uh, or hangry or whatever, um, salt, low salt and dehydration is one of those first symptoms. Um, then we'll start to get nauseous. We'll start to get cloudy, foggy head. We'll get cramps. Um, and eventually the body will go into what they call hyponatremia, which you can die from and you can die from low salt. And most people have heard stories and, you know, usually occurs in the summertime, either maybe it's on the military bases in California or some of the athletic teams in Texas and Florida, they're out working and, and running hard and playing in the sun, sweating a lot. And then one of them will either pass out and there's been some deaths actually because of hyponatremia even though they're drinking, quote unquote, plenty of water. And if you've ever noticed, our tears are salty. Our sweat is salty and our urine is salty. And so when our bodies are processing anything, um, we are burning through water and we're burning through salt. And if we just replace that with water, and it can be good clean water, we're still going to be burning through salt because our bodies require that. You know, you could drink distilled water. Water is the universal solvent. And so you're not going to urinate or cry or sweat distilled water. When you sweat, when you cry, when you urinate, our bodies are flushing salt because it helps clean the body. It helps balance the intercellular, extracellular fluids. The way my hand moves is because an electric current passes from my mind down to my muscles and fires those muscles to move through electricity. And so the only difference in you and I visiting one moment alive and the next moment if we died, outside of a spiritual discussion, the real difference in both of us would be the absence of an electric current. And so our bodies have to be great conductors of electricity. And that's why we need these electrolytes or something that conducts electricity. And so that's one of the early symptoms of that dehydration and low salt is you know, headaches, uh, nauseous, will, feeling weak, feeling fatigued. And oftentimes low salt manifests itself in a food craving or a sugar craving. You know, a lot of times today, if you feel a headache coming on, rather than going right to the ibuprofen, your, your brain or your head doesn't have an ibuprofen deficiency. Um, and I'm not against ibuprofen. There's a, there's a great place for it. But I think sometimes when we have that first sign of a headache, if we were to go and get a great big glass of water and a little bit of salt under our tongue, oftentimes that can really stop a headache. It also can stop hunger cravings as somebody's, you know, maybe they're doing a fast for the religious reasons, or they're doing a fast to do a cleanse or just to kind of reset the adrenals or whatever it is. Salt actually is a great curb of hunger pains and it also curbs sugar cravings. Yeah, those are all definitely symptoms I've experienced. And it's amazing how just a little bit of salt swigged down with some water can get rid of a headache or dizziness or fatigue like really quickly. Uh, it like acts faster than a pill. It's amazing to me. Um, and how about on the too much salt side? Like what what are some symptoms that we're having too much salt? And is there a thing that's too much salt? Yeah, so if you look at a healthy kidney, um, the, a healthy kidney can process a lot of salt, um, way more than most people realize. In fact, there's a great book on salt. It's called Salt, Your Way to Help, written by a Dr. David Brownstein, who's an MD out of the Midwest. And he says that a healthy kidney can actually process up to four ounces of salt per day, which is a massive amount of salt that our, our kidneys can process. Um, now, above that, then there would certainly be some, be some problems. And anybody that has kidney issues uh, or is on dialysis, then you can take everything I've said today and throw it out the window because a, a, a kidney that is, is compromised does start to have some problems processing salt. But a healthy kidney can process a lot of salt. Now, 
in nature, animals don't overdose on salt. You can put a big salt lick out in front of, of any animal and they will really chow down and, and lick that salt a lot. And then they'll go over and they'll get more water because they know that that balance is so important. And that's kind of what I've found for myself. You know, on my kitchen table, I've got a little dish full of salt crystals, kind of about the size of a peppercorn. And if I'm feeling, uh, you know, if I've got a hunger craving or sugar craving, or if I'm just walking it, you know, past this dish and it salt sounds good, I'll just put a little piece of salt under my tongue. And initially that salt crystal will taste really, really good. And it will taste very sweet, actually, if it's a natural salt crystal. And that means that our bodies you know, probably a little bit low on salt. And so as we start to eat a little bit of salt, then our thirst will come. And so then we can, you know, drink some more water. And, and that to me is a great indication of, of getting enough salt. And so in this book, um, salt your way to health. And there's another book uh, called the salt fix by Dr. James D. Nicol Antonio. And another book that I really like is called your body's many cries for water. And all of these authors talk about once you switch to a natural diet, and you're not getting all that processed food and then with the processed salt, but you should feel free to salt your food liberally and then actually start adding a little bit of salt to your water. Because if we're drinking good amounts of water or we're out for a run, or maybe we're a roofer or we're a firefighter or we're out for a bike ride or even hot yoga, our bodies are flushing lots of salt and lots of water. And so we need to make sure we're replacing not just the water, but also replacing the salt. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think um, one thing I've heard you speak about on other podcasts is um, how there's such a thing as drinking too much water alone, particularly among athletes. And I'll just share personal experience I had with salt. Um, So I, like you said, when you're eating more protein, um, like on a carnivore diet, you you need more salt. Um, But... (laughs) you can take it too far and you can be, and I, I I took it definitely too far and I was being kind of stupid about it. So I was eating, um, probably over 400 grams of protein in the form of steaks a day, um, salting them very heavily. It got to the point where people would look at pictures of my steaks on Instagram and say, what is that stuff all over your food? Like it didn't look normal. Um, so that's very heavy salt consumption. I was also taking in salt, like when I woke up with water to get my day started before I went to bed with water, um, before workouts. Um, and I was like always thirsty, always chugging water. I was overeating. So eating more protein, which made me pee more, which made me need more water and more salt. And then I was putting more and more salt on my food, which made me want to eat more. Um, so it was this vicious cycle. And, uh, I was waking up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom like eight times or more. And I, you know, had no idea what was going on. I ended up seeing all these kidney doctors and experts and they did, you know, scans of my kidneys, ultrasounds. And they said, everything is great. Like you have excellent kidney function. And what I found out is actually my kidneys were working very, very well. It's a great thing. I had healthy kidneys because what was happening, I, someone ultimately ended up recommending that I track my salt for a couple of days. It seems so obvious, but I, I did. And I was consuming about 40 grams of uh, sodium a day, not salt, sodium, which is even more in salt and um, drinking uh, you know, over 10 liters of water a day. So I was basically going through this process of just excreting and consuming massive amounts of salt each day. Um, and that's where like, to your point, listening to your body, but you can take it way too far. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that and also some of the dangers of, of just drinking way too much water? And do you think we as a society drink too much water? I think as far as, you know, the, the society drink too much water, I think that it, it's, you have both extremes. Um, and I think you have problems at either end. I think generally speaking, if you talk to just the general public, I think a lot of the general public is probably drinking too little water because they're offsetting it with, you know, sugary sports drinks with, you know, coffee with tea. And those, I mean, I'm a coffee fan. I like tea. Coffee can also be dehydrating. It's a bit of a diuretic. And so if we're not drinking enough uh, fluid and we're drinking things that are dehydrating, then I think that's a different problem. And then on the other end, people hear, oh, I need to drink more water. 
And so they'll go clear to the other end and they'll drink so much water that they'll start flushing all the salts out of their body. And so I think balance and blending our life is, is a much better approach. Um, when you mentioned 40 grams of sodium, um, so when you look at grams and salt, salt binds 60-40. And so if you're doing 40 grams of sodium, you've got another 60 grams of chloride typically. So now you're talking 100 grams of salt a day, which is a lot of salt. And um, yeah. <laughs> that, that kind of kind of proves my point, though, that your, your kidneys, a healthy kidney can process a lot of salt just fine without any problems. Um, but as you pointed out, then that can really start to throw the body out of balance in other ways. I and mean, if you're drinking just, if you're drinking plenty of water and you're getting that much salt, that's, that would generally be okay. But then you start adding, you know, that much protein and that much, you know, other foods, and then you can start really having some, some problems there. So like when you go out of the hospital, you're hooked up to an IV, which is predominantly sodium and chloride. And they can flush a lot of saline through your body and you'll have to urinate and you'll have to be hooked up to a catheter if you can't, you know, get up and go to the bathroom, but you can, your body can process a lot of salt and a lot of fluids. Um, but then we, we also can throw the body, body out of balance pretty well. Yeah. Um, and one thing I wanted to ask about like with salt and water and balancing these things, um, like, I've, I've had a lot of other guests talk extensively about the need for balance between salt and magnesium and potassium. But one thing I haven't talked as much about, and I think you'd have some great perspectives on is iodine. And a lot of people recommend, you know, use some of these light salts because they have iodine in them. Um, you have to make sure you're getting some form of iodine. A lot of salts say on them, not a sufficient source of iodine. Um, what's the deal with iodine in salt? I'm glad you brought that up because any discussion on salt would not be complete without a discussion on iodine because people have come to associate the two. Now, if we went back pre-World War I, nobody would have associated iodine with salt. Now, iodine is a super essential nutrient. And my guess is that most people listening to this podcast are probably iodine deficient and should go out of their way to find foods that are rich in iodine. Iodine rich foods, a lot of you know, seafood, seaweed, dulse, kelp, you know, things like that are really rich in iodine. And there's others too, but a lot of people are iodine deficient. And especially for women, that's a problem because iodine deficiency is linked to all kinds of reproductive health, energy levels, tumor growth. And in men too, um, iodine deficiency is linked to a lot of these problems. So the reason or, or how salt became associated with iodine is back around World War I. And so in World War I, the draft was instituted and the U.S. military started drafting men across the U.S. And what they found was that at that time, the Midwest particularly had a problem with goiter. And goiter is a swelling of the thyroid because of an iodine deficiency. And the military said, look, we can't keep drafting men if they have a goiter. There's that, it doesn't work. That's a problem. That's a health problem. And we need to do something to solve this iodine deficiency in the U.S., particularly the Midwest. And the Midwest makes, it makes sense because the Midwest is furthest away from the ocean. They're not getting the, sea fee, the, the fresh seafood. They're not getting the, the fresh seaweed. And at that time, particularly, the Midwest was eating, out of, like a lot of the country, but eating out of cans, eating processed flour, refined sugars, and, and foods that were devoid of iodine. And over the years, we know our soils have even gotten more depleted in some of these nutrients and micronutrients. So a group of scientists and the military sat down and said, what can we do to get people to eat more iodine to solve this iodine deficiency? And I would hope that somebody suggested a campaign to eat more fish. Uh, maybe you had some seaweed to the diet um, and other foods. Uh, some cheeses are richer in iodine. And to just add iodine back to the diet instead of just eating out of processed cans and foods and flours that have been refined and unbleached and things like that. Well, they tried a few different things to add iodine to the diet. Um, you know, a lot of cities today will add fluoride to the water to kind of, you know, push fluoride onto the population. And with iodine, what they found was a very stable way to, to store and to, and to force iodine consumption was through salt. 
because salt is necessary for life, everybody knows you have to eat salt to live. And because of that, this group of scientists decided that by adding iodine to salt, you would force the American population to eat more iodine. And at that time, they went to salt companies and said, look, this is the new rule. And if you do not add iodine to your salt product, you have to put a warning on the salt that says this salt does not supply iodide, a necessary nutrient. Even if the salt contains natural levels of iodine, unless the manufacturer adds potassium iodide, they have to put on the label, this salt does not supply iodide, a necessary nutrient, as a way to force people to eat more iodine. And it actually worked. It did solve the problem. People started eating more iodine. Now, today we know that the iodine that's added to salt is less than 10% bioavailable. And so it's a very poor source of iodine. But if you have no other source of iodine, salt's probably a good place to get it because it is absolutely necessary. However, I would um, throw out that I think as important as iodine is, there's a lot better sources of iodine than processed iodized salt. And so yeah. that's what I encourage people to do. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense. Um, that's, that's really interesting. And how about, and I know you can also get like trace mineral drops that have iodine as well. That's another way to do it. Um, how about just, this has been super helpful there. The, the last question I want to ask you is just talk a little bit more about Redmond and what's the difference between like a Redmond real salt and a Himalayan pink salt. Um, and what are maybe some of the benefits? Yeah, so if we circle back around to that very first question about how salt's produced, um, you can still today get salt the three ways. It can come from a current ocean, it can come from an ancient seabed, or it can come from a dead sea. And so the real salt, the real difference, is it's from an ancient seabed in Utah. And you know, today, if you go out to our oceans, unfortunately, you know, we humans haven't been the best stewards of our our planet Earth, and there's a lot of things in the ocean that wasn't there back in the Jurassic era. We have microbeads, we have plastics, and we have things like the BP oil spill. We go back a little further, we have Exxon Valdez. And so unfortunately, a lot of our oceans today, or maybe even all the oceans today, just aren't as clean as they were back you know, eons ago. And the Himalayan deposit is a very similar deposit to the one here in Utah. Uh, it occurs in Pakistan, and there's a lot of deposits over there that are harvested and then brought to, to the consumer today. So, and then there's good sea salts too. There's, you know, there's, a, there's brands of French gray salt, there's Hawaiian red salt, there's, um, there's a lot of good salts on the market. And so rather than picking out a particular brand, what I do is I recommend people ask themselves three questions. Um, and I think these three questions work, whether you're looking for a great steak um, or you're looking for a great salt. And so the first question is know who is producing it. Today, a lot of our food travels a lot of miles and it tra transfers a lot of hands. And so being able to know who is producing our food, one, I think it's great because we can kind of connect to that um, company or that individual. And then we can also find the answers to the next two questions, which I think are probably more important. So once we know who's producing it, the second question is know the source. In terms of salt, is that coming from an ancient seabed? Is it coming from a, a current ocean? Or is it coming from a river in Australia? You know, exactly where is the salt coming from? If it's, if it's steak, you know, is it a feedlot? Is it coming from a grass-fed, more open environment? Um, and so I think knowing the source with our food is really important. And then the third question, is what are they doing to it? Are they putting anything in? Are they taking anything out? And I think if we ask ourselves those three questions, whether it's salt or a great steak, we're going to start finding some better quality food and make some more informed food choices. Yeah, that's fantastic. And uh, I just, I want to thank you, Daryl. This has been excellent. You've provided so much value. I think listeners will really, really find this helpful. And I'll be directing everyone in the future who asks me about salt to, to this episode. So thank you so much for providing this resource. Where can folks find out more about you, about Redmond, et cetera? And I'll, of course, have links in the show notes and at carnivorecast.com as well. So at realsalt.com, just www.realsalt.com salt.com has more information about us. 
Um, a couple of my favorite books, there's a great book on salt called Salt, A World History. That is an excellent book to learn about all the way salt has, has come over the years. Um, and then, of course, social media, we're on you know, Facebook, Instagram, and would love to connect with uh, any of your listeners there. Perfect. Well, thanks again for your time, Daryl, and hope you have a fantastic weekend. You too, Scott. Thanks. Bye. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out. And share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered, or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at CarnivoreCast, or go to CarnivoreCast.com. You can also email me at info at CarnivoreCast.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.